All right. So I am with Watt PD, Waterloo Professional Development Program. What is Watt PD? Well, all six faculties require their co-op students to take uh, a co-op or to take a professional development course on their work terms. So all six faculties require, uh, some faculties require their students to take four courses, some require them to take five courses. We have an army of uh, TPAs, uh, teaching program assistants, uh, working with us. Those are co-op students that we've hired. This term we have 18 uh, co-op students. We also have an army of part-time markers. I do believe this year we're, we have uh, in excess of 15,000 students coming through our program. Next year, the pro projected numbers are 16,000. Uh, a lot of these courses require written work, so you need a small army of able-bodied, keen minds. And uh, also in our department, well, we have the director, first of all, Ann Fannin in the back row. <laughs> Say hi, Ann. <laughs> right, she's the director. We have the assistant director. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, teaching and program assistants, our co-op students, ISCs, instructional support coordinator. I am one of those. I am also an instructor. All right, instructors are generally faculty members throughout the, the university who has written the course. Sometimes the people who write the course step away and we hire another, another person to, to, to run the course. The ISCs basically uh, coordinate the markers with the instructors to make sure, the instructors make sure that the content is relevant, that it's up to date, that the assessments are, are well done. The ISCs make sure that the TPAs are marking to a, a high standard. Okay, I promise you that this is not just an hour of propaganda for Watt PD. <laughs> what courses do we offer? Well, we offer co-op fundamentals, critical reflection and report writing, communication, teamwork, project management, problem solving, conflict resolution, intercultural skills, developing reasoned conclusion. Um, I wrote that one about three years ago. Workplace skills for the engineers, developing effective plans, and ethics in practicing or in engineering practice. So basically, that's to prepare the engineers for their professional exams. Two of the courses right now are offline; they're being redeveloped from the ground up. I am currently writing PD9, ethical decision making in the workplace. Right? Do we need it? Well. As Global Mail tells us, more business schools are making ethics a focus. No longer is it just something they yell at their graduates as they're leaving the school, you know, don't be evil. <laughs> now it's part of the core cu curriculum. The Independent has sponsored a competition of sorts. Okay, prove to us that you're the most ethical company and we'll give you an award. Do we need this sort of thing? Well, SNC Lavalin has pretty much written the course for me. Right? <laughs> Uh, or just general corruption, uh, or the Rob Ford conflict of interest, right? I didn't know that was a conflict of interest. I didn't read the municipal, municipal act. I can't be held accountable, right? Or, uh, th this is an interesting one, Edmonton nurse testifies opening clinic to give H1N1 shots to friends and family. This is interesting for two reasons. One, the shots were slated to be disposed of. And two, it's an instance of queue jumping. Right? We need it. We need, we need the ability, we need people out there who have a conscience, who, who's, right, who's able to reason through these ethical, well, sometimes it's a, it's a minefield. This is my favorite one. Importance of ethics in the workplace, <laughs> free essays. <laughs> I would love to think that the person who put this up saw the irony in it, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm not surprised anymore by anything. So, are workplace skills important? Instructors, the university, those who write the courses, not, not even people who write the courses, faculty throughout the university have bought into it. Yes, work skill, workplace skills are important. What about the university administration? They're hopping up and down on this program saying, here, here's one way that we can make, that we can give our graduates a competitive edge, right? It's important because even if our students can go toe to toe with peers from universities across, across Canada and the states, if we give them that extra edge, right? Here's how to resolve conflict in the workplace. 
Right? Here's how to problem solve. Here's how to communicate. Right? If we give them that edge, right, they're going to fare well. Business leaders, a resounding yes. Here's an interesting article from the Globe and Mail. Why university students need a well-rounded education. Now the tide seems to be turning with business leaders lamenting that, although the new talent arriving at their doorstep has deep technical knowledge, it lacks the skills needed to put this knowledge to full use. Right? What good is a set of technical skills if you can't communicate it? Right? If you're just a curmudgeon and you can't cooperate, you don't play nice with other people, Right. What use are those skills? Well, I guess there are. Last night there was an article, I can't remember uh, which newspaper it was, it was on Google News, a uh, hacker and a, 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 a self-declared lifelong troll was arrested and, and sentenced to jail for hacking and for being a general nuisance. I mean, so yeah, they can use their skills, but certainly not ethically. Right? We don't want to give that as an option to our graduates. Right? Oh, you can always be a troll. No, we want, to, we want to aim higher than that. A report from the States coming out of uh, 2010 interviewed, uh, surveyed industry leaders throughout, well, across the board. How, what were the numbers? A couple of million? Yeah, it was 400 employers representing 2 million American employees. Right. And they said, they came back, and they said, Here, here's the things that we're looking for in your graduates. They can communicate orally. They can communicate through writing. Right? They have critical thinking skills. They have problem-solving skills. They're able to make ethical decisions. Right? Resounding. We need this. And the colleges and universities need to do this for us. They put the burden on us. Right? Whether or not we like it or not, we have that burden. So, are workplace skills important? Instructors say yes, administration of the university says yes, business leaders say yes. What about our students? What do our students say? Well, here, here's where we have diverging interests. Our interests as educators are to give our students a competitive edge. Right. Our students' interests, on the other hand, to do as little as possible to meet the graduate graduation requirements. Yes, I am playing to the lowest common denominator. And this isn't just an issue for PD courses. I had, uh, at the end of every first lecture I give, I ask my students three questions. What year are you in? What program are you in? Do, you, I, need to, do I need to clarify anything about the course? And then I give them the option to ask me a question about anything, and I'll answer it. One student last summer had the nerve to write, what's the least amount of work that I need to do in this course to get an A plus? So I answered it. I said, would you think it wise to walk into your boss's office the first day and say, what's the least amount of work that I need to do to get a promotion? How long are you going to last there, right? If it's not going to work out there, don't think it's going to work in here. But that's the attitude, right? Now, what about being forced to take a course? Right? If you're in co-op, you have to take what PD courses? Now, the question is, from our perspective, it's in our students' self-interest to take these course. But we force them to do it. What's the effect of forcing them? Course, you know, what's the effect of forcing them to do something they would probably rather not do if they weren't compelled to do it? Here's an interesting thought experiment I ran with my business ethics course last, last summer. All right? Let's assume that you have a choice between action A and action B. Okay? Let's assume that it's in your self-interest to do A, but not to do B. Right? Of the two options, this is in your rational self-interest. It's in your self-interest to do that. So if you're acting rationally, you would never do B. Right? You wouldn't. Now, let's assume you're forced to do A. Right? The government comes in and says, all right, you have to do this. Right? So you can't do B. Now, I ask my students this question. If somebody forbid you from doing B, would you want to do B even though it's not in your self-interest? 
All right, I want your opinion. All right, so make sure it's on. Make sure you got a blue light. All right, if someone forbid you from doing B, would you want to do B even though it's not in your self-interest? So this is our opinion? Yeah, this is your opinion. opinion. Our opinion of what your student said. No, no, uh, no, this is your opinion. Okay. Yeah, it's your opinion. Good question. It's your opinion. We should have three more, a couple more. Eight, excellent. All right, so this is what you said. Uh -huh. D, we have two people. Here's what my business ethics students said. 45% said we would do it <laughs> just because it was forbidden. Even though it's not in my self-interest, we would do it. And I asked why, and they said because we want the freedom to screw up our lives. We want that option. Right? So even though it's in their self-interest to do these courses, right, these PD courses. The business leaders say, this is what we're looking for in our, in our students, in your students coming to work for us. The students, once they're forced to do it, will dig in their heels. I think it's a very human reaction. It's a very human reaction. Another thing is that the material is commonly dismissed as common sense. Right? So when I tell you to use proper spelling and grammar, focus on the problem, not the person, learn how to navigate through office politics and tricky situations, and never think of altered cultures as weird, I tell you that and you go, duh. Right? But as we always try and jump up and down, workplace skills are the easiest to learn content-wise. I can tell you, proof, proof, proofread your work, Proofread your emails before you send them, right? Do people do it? I had a student email me, say uh, he, he had a problem with something in the course. I sent back a reply. Here's how you can get around that problem. He sent back a reply. Thank you for your very useless reply. <laughs> and I emailed back and I said, did you really mean that? Because <laughs> if you did mean that, please tell me how I can help you. And I got this really long apology. <laughs> You can tell students until you're blue in the face. Proofread your work. Right? Don't be a jerk at work. Right? Focus on the problem, not the person. You can tell them that, but oh, to get them to do it, that's really difficult. And it's really difficult on the on online, right? I mean, if it, you were in person, maybe you could jump them down and wave your arms and whatever, but on an online context, it's really difficult. So the, the challenge for YPD is in the context of diverging interests, in the context of students balking at ha having to do something that they would rather not do, even though it's in their self-interest, and students dismissing the material as common sense, how can we engage our students in this online context? How can we do that? Now, it's bad enough when you're in the classroom, right? <laughs> if you allow technology Right? Unless you take a really hard line against computers or, or cell phones and you stand at the door and you make everyone hand in their whatever, you're going to be facing and fighting against the Facebooks, the YouTubes, sports, and porn. I had a student, uh, when I was teaching at Western, I had a young lady come up to me after one lecture. Professor Andres, the guy in front of me, was watching porn your whole class. Like, really? You can't wait 50 minutes. You can't go 50 minutes without looking at porn. But that's the reality. So one of the ways I thought was, ah, I'm going to introduce the use of eye clickers in my course. Right? So what I do is I incentivize attendance and participation. I say, you have to come to 75% of the classes. You choose which 75%. You're free to not come to any, but I'm free to not give you marks then. Right? And they have to answer 75% of the questions. So if, throughout the lecture, I have feed, or just you know, eye clicker questions. What do they look like? Uh, like this one. Uh, we were talking about incentives in one class. And I said, would you buy a car that didn't have airbags or seat belts? And you think, that's a no-brainer. This is how they responded. 81% said that they would not. 11% um, 
said that they would. And you go, oh, that's very strange. So I open it up to the floor. I say, why would you? One answer was, well, my dad's an engineer in the automotive industry, and I know he could install them for me for cheaper. He's like, OK. Another one was, well, if I didn't have seatbelts or airbags, I'd be a much safer driver. Yeah, you're not the only one on the road, though, right? But anyway, it allows, right, when students see that, they go, wait, wh what? And then you allow the, the minority to give their voice. And sometimes it is reasonable what they say. Right. Another question, uh, should a rational person, so this was in my uh, film 110A, uh, knowledge and reality, I think. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it was this question. Uh, should a rational person jettison the belief that the Mayans predicted the end of the world? And this is the most awesome distribution. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did is I said, all right, 30 seconds, turn, turn to the person beside you and argue with them and tell them why you're white, right. And then I did another poll, and it squished more to the middle, <laughs> right? So it's this interaction. And it, it allows everyone to have their voice, because you ask for a raise of hands, very few people are going to do it. You ask them to push a button, they're much more likely to do it. Right? It gives everyone a voice, and it allows everyone to see what everyone else's opinion is, and it allows them to debate it. So. Here's the problem, though. The problem is disengaged participation. I noticed this this summer in Hagee Hall, 1101, nice big theater. Everyone's hidden behind the computer screen. And then when I put up an iClicker question, all of a sudden you see a bunch of faces <laughs> peeking out behind the, the laptop and just reaching, looking at the screen and pushing a button. Like, I you didn't really think about that question, right? So. How do I get around that? Well, for one of my courses, or for ethics courses, it works very well. I play games. Okay. So instead of just I click your questions, I say, all right, two participants up at the front now. And I would have a bag, much like this bag, full of prizes. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the laptops would get shut down, and people were paying attention. Because two play players were playing for prizes. The winner would be able to take a prize. Now, I've been soundly criticized for this, discussing this with my colleagues. Right? You're just bribing students. Right? They should be learning just for the sake of learning. Right? Our job is not to entertain. Here's my rebuttal. All right. We'll put this into action, OK? I'm going to teach you about Nash Equilibrium. Any economists here? Excellent. All right. <laughs> Nash, equi Nash Equilibrium. What's Nash e Equilibrium? In a game that is a list of strategies, one for each player, such that no player can get a better payoff by switching to some other strategy that is available to her, while all the other players adhere to the strategy specified for them in the list. Now, I can repeat that ad nauseum. I could rephrase that ad nauseum. And students will just still not get it. I could even give examples, and I could talk through the examples, and students still just blah, blah, blah. Is Andrew still talking, right? Or I could play a game, all right? Here's the objective. Coordinate your interests with the interests of everyone else in this room, all right? Here's the gameplay. If you press the A button, you will get, right now, a chocolate-covered almond. <coughs> okay? I have it right here. <laughs> All right? If everyone presses E, the E button, I will bring brownies next week. Okay? I will take my lunch hour. If everyone pushes E, I will get your names and your office. And I will deliver a brownie to your door over lunch. If you're not there, too bad. Right? <laughs> okay? Oh. Not going to throw that in there, right? Vote. All right? Oh, 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 oh! Wait, I got to cancel that vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I forgot the most important one. If you press E and someone else presses A, you get nothing. 
Whew, good catch. Because <laughs> otherwise that wasn't much of a game. <laughs> All right, so if you press A, you get a, a, a chocolate colored almond. If everyone presses E, I'll bring a brownie. But if at least one person, if only one person presses A, you press E, you got nothing. All right, now, now we can vote. Could we have a few minutes to get together on this? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Are we like chatting time? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Everybody like chocolate? <laughs> Two of us have already cast our votes. There might be a rather than those who haven't cast oh, yet. Okay. Well, you can change them. Can, can we change them? Change them? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How? No. Yeah. No. I no, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. I can tell you that I voted E. I'm happy to share that. <laughs> but, but, if, 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 right, if you're not going to be in your office next week, you don't get anything, right? Oh, right? for crying out loud. <laughs> and if you're not going to be on campus. We can all have chocolate almonds right now. Yeah. I mean. You can give yours to me. All right, one more. All right, we need one more person. All right. So what do we got? Did you vote? <laughs> no, I did not vote. <laughs> All right, who, 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 who? This is where the awkward moment that the person, yeah. So I did this in my business ethics course. There were 140, 130 some students in the room. Everyone was screaming, push E, push E. A <laughs> hundred and, well, one person, only one person pushed A. So I said, all right, come get it. All right, so. <laughs> So what's the point? The point is, if I, so if there are only two of us playing, so if I choose A, you'll want to choose A, why? Because getting chocolate is better than getting nothing. Right? And if you choose A, I'm going to want to choose A because again, getting a chocolate is better than getting nothing. Similarly, if I choose E, you're going to choose E, and if you choose E, I'm going to choose E. So we have two Nash equilibria. Now, what, what is better than me just repeating ad nauseum that quote or playing for keeps? Because people all of a sudden are pay, paying attention, right? All right, how about this one? Single round of bargaining. So the objective, okay? Leave the game with money. I need two volunteers up at the front. All right, Shannon, who else? And Look at all that money. <laughs> hey, it's out of my own pocket. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. So, Don't win. so you guys, all right, here, you guys have to decide who's player one and who is player two. Player one has the advantage. All right. So, here are the rules. Gameplay. Player one will be given 10 dimes. Okay, I will give you 10 dimes, Scott. Player one will then give player two some of those dimes. And by some, it can mean none. Okay. Okay. Uh, player two will decide to accept or reject the offer. If player two accepts, you keep your allotment of dimes. If you reject Shannon, you leave with nothing. Okay. Oh, and what if I'm just being very resentful about the almonds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did, 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 you, uh, did you eat the almond already? Because you could use it as a bargaining. No, nope. but I can give you nothing. <laughs> oh, but then if you reject. Yeah, neither of you get anything. Oh. <laughs> so it's probably useful for you to know how vengeful I'm feeling. Consider what to offer me. All right, Scott, make your, make your offer. 
What is it? Five. Five, five and five. See? Here. Okay, you can, you can sit down. All right, then you can. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. Did you accept? Did you accept? I just assumed you accept. <laughs> yeah, it's a moment if, the of home, if the chocolate thing hadn't happened, I would accept without hesitation. <laughs> awesome. You're that vindictive. Awesome. Really wanted a brownie in my office. I accept. All right. Now here's the thing, right? Uh, the first game, we saw equilibrium. There were two equilibrium. In this game, there's only one. And that equilibrium is Scott offers one dime and keeps nine dimes, and Shannon accepts. That's the only equilibrium. Humans do not play rationally in that game. Right? Economists predict that we will. Like the person will offer one, and the person will accept one, because leaving with one is better than leaving with nothing. You know who plays this game rationally? Chimps. <laughs> Right? There is no conception of fairness in chimps. They will play rationally every time. Anyway, why play games? Why prizes? Because they're a memorable way to drive home a point, and they help me see if my students, my audience, grasp the concept. Because I can apply it in one context, and if they get it, I okay, all right, here's another context. See if you got it. And when it falls off the rails, I can jump up and down, okay, you haven't gotten it yet. There's another reason. It's a fantastic British game. The Brits. All right. Golden Balls is the name of the show. All right. Uh, so two players, they scheme to, to make money together. And then more often than not, I haven't watched too many episodes, but they're given this choice. The last move of the game. So in this case, uh, the money on the table is 13000 And they have an option to split or steal. If both split, they leave with $6,500 each. If both choose to steal, they leave with nothing. If one steals and the other splits, the person who steals gets $13,000. All right. How would you, how would you play this? A, you would split it. B, you would steal. And you're playing against me. You're playing against me. Okay. So, would you split A or would you steal B? Six of you would be <laughs> six of you would be leaving with nothing. <laughs> you click B and you're just giving me the play. <laughs> who, who clicked B? Who clicked B? I can find out. Anne? Who else? There's one more. <laughs> oh my gosh. Awesome. But the thing is. That's the equilibrium strategy, right? That's the equilibrium strategy. Now, I played this with my business ethics students at the very, the very last, um, I, I, I played throughout the whole semester of Prisoner's Dilemma. That's a classic Prisoner's Dilemma. And I kept jumping up and down on the point. For the whole semester, the last lecture, I, I played them the video. And then I asked them, well, would you split or steal? Still, 46% of them would cooperate and split. It's like, are you really business students? Have you been paying attention here in your economics courses? Right? But, oh, sorry. So why, why games? Why prizes? They're a good way to highlight the disconnect. I played the uh, similar situation in my game theory slash decision theory, theory class slash probability theory. I said, have, or how well do you know the prisoner's dilemma? Like, very well, move on, and two, never heard of it. And like 80% of them said, know it very well, move on. Next slide, I played with them, <laughs> the prisoner's dilemma. More than 80% of them played irrationally. So at that point, I'm jumping up and down going, you think you know but you don't, so pay attention. So they are a good way to highlight the disconnect. Also, I achieve engaged participation. Because okay? no longer are they just reaching over their computers and pushing a button randomly. Right? Everyone wants a chance at the prize bag. Right? And only people who win get to see it. 
And it helps when the people who win want to play again, because that's a signal to the other people that it's worth doing. Right? So the challenge for Watt PD, right? diverging interests, students bulking at taking the courses, dismissing it as common sense. How do I hope to engage the students in PD9, the ethics course that I'm writing? Well, hopefully with interactive games. So this is how it's going to be set up. I'm going to have a lecture. It's going to be 20, 25 minutes voiceover presentation. They can listen to it online. They can download it as an MP4, MP something, right? As a video, a podcast. Uh, after the lecture is done, they will play a game or a series of games. So each, there are going to be 10 units. Each unit is going to have five rounds of games. And then afterwards, hopefully, the games will raise their ire and they will enter the discussion board. The lecture is going to be hosted in Learn. Right? So all PD courses are done online through Learn. The games are going to be hosted by CEL. In fact, they're the ones that is, they're building this for me. <laughs> oh, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, and the discussion board is going to be in Learn. Now, this is how I envision it. We, this has never been done before in an online context. Right? CEL, when I first pitched this to them, uh, one of the managers rocked back in his chair, grabbed his head, said, if we get this right, we're going to Vegas. <laughs> right? If we get it wrong. <laughs> it's a, right? uh, my boss is gone. Right? Put her neck out for me. Right? CL, all right, we're going to go with this. Now, the gains are worth 10%. Marks are based on participation and recorded and learned. Okay, so students aren't going to be marked whether they play the game right or wrong. I want to incentivize honesty. Right? So, marks are going to be the answer. So, there are going to be 50, 50 questions altogether, 50 games altogether. So, if they play, you know, all the games, they get 10%. If they play, you know, 90% of the games, they get 9 out of 10, right? Now, the points are awarded on how they play the game. So I've, di I've distinguished or I've broken apart, I've di divorced game or, uh, marks from points. And the points are going to be hosted on a leaderboard in, in the game section. This is what CEL is building for us. Then the data, the gameplay data, is going to get dumped back into the discussion board. So students have a record of how the games are played, and then maybe that will incentivize discussion, hopefully. Now, right now it's set up that they're going to be playing against a version of me or some fictional character that I've created. Right, so the, the, each character will have a particular bio, giving them clues as to how, how they might play the game. Ideally, I would love it if they could build a parlor, a games room, like online, that they could go and play against each other. Maybe if this one works, <laughs> I can convince the, the powers that be that that's an awesome idea. The leaderboard, uh, students will play, well, they'll have an option to opt in, right? So that they, they can either go with their real name or anonymous. I'd wanted, I'd wanted them to have the, the ability to make an avatar or upload an avatar and make their own, their own names, but CEL's like, well, what if somebody names themselves like Ding Dong 69, right? I said, well, we can get them with the ethics, right? They're still bound by the ethics code, the, the code of conduct for university, and they're like, ah, it's not worth it. I'm like, oh, all right, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't want to push too hard in this first iteration. Right? Let's just see if the concept works, see if students buy into it. So what will a game in an ethics course like, look like? Okay. What would a game look like? All right, got lots of time. Let's say you're a journalist in a city in which IKEA ha is, has moved in, their first IKEA store in this city. You're a journalist for a local paper. Okay. And your editor has made it clear to you that if you get a, a story, it's going to get on the first, the first page. It'll be front page material. Now, 
whoever goes, whoever goes, you're invited to this, this open, the grand opening. Okay? You're, op there, you're invited to the grand opening. Whoever goes will get a front page story. You will get food and drink. And you will get a great discount. 25% off everything in the store that night only. Right? Whoever doesn't go gets a second page story. Now, what would you do? What would you do? Okay. Would you attend and guaranteed stuff and story? Right? You get to rub shoulders with the, the political leaders, right? the wheelers and dealers in the community. You get IKEA stuff at a good rate. You get a front page story. Your name's on the cover. That can't be bad, can it? All right, six more of you need to vote. Would you attend? Or would you be content with a second page story? What do you want? Your name on the front page? Interacting with the, the wheelers and dealers in the community? A discount to IKEA? All right, two more you need to vote. All right, A, awesome. Six of you would, excellent, excellent. Two of you get stuck with the second page story. Why, why is it worth the second page story? Who voted, who voted B? All right, why? I just don't wanna be connected to the 25% discount. Is that a problem? Yeah, yeah. I'm getting a 25% discount because of this. Okay, CBC, oh, I love this, this report. CBC just went to town on other, the journalists who did. And they posted, here's what the, the journalists in Canada subscribe to as an ethics code. We do not accept the free or reduced rate use of valuable goods or services offered because of our position. We do not solicit gifts or favor, favors for personal use and should promptly return unsolicited gifts of more than nominal value. If it is impractical to return the gift, we will give it to an appropriate charity. That's in their code of conduct. <coughs> now, everyone who is a journalist in Canada should subscribe to. CBC just, oh, I love this paragraph. CBC declined the offer to shop because of a policy against employees accepting gifts. However, Nelly Gun uh, Gonzalez went to the event to pose the ethics question to IKEA. <laughs> Not only didn't we not go, right, we're doing our due diligence and questioning the ethics of this. But here, right, that's a game. And I jump up and down, right, each game is going to have a moral. How do you judge success? How do you assess your own happiness? Right, because if success is rubbing shoulders with the powers that be, if success means getting more for less, if success means getting your name on the front page no matter what, then yes, you're going to attend. And if you're not willing to attend, are you willing to do the right thing even though it costs you? It will cost you, right? You will see your coworker or other people, other journalists, rise the ladder faster than you. So who wins in this game? Well, well, how are you going to play it? Anyway, this leaderboard is a huge experiment. CEL, my boss, we're going, we're running with it. We're hoping it will work. And if this iteration, this, this first run works, this leaderboard can be used by anyone, right? If you have an online, you, you do your course online, you think of how you can use a leaderboard, it can be used, right? This is, this is, dom this is not domain specific. I mean, the games might be different, but it's just one of these things. So instead of just having people participate, right, you get this engaged participation. I'm not sure what the prize is going to be for the, the top of the leaderboard. We haven't figured that one out yet. A gift card, I don't know, lunch with Greg, oh. <laughs> right? But it's just another way to grab their attention, to get them paying attention. Hopefully it will work. I don't know, maybe you want me back next year to see, <laughs> give, give you a, 
thumbs up or uh, it was a train wreck. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much.